speaker is um, the next speaker is uh, Professor Stefano Mazzoleni, who is one of the co-organizers of the school. And uh, uh, Stefano is uh, one of my friends and colleagues uh, since a long time. So it is a pleasure to introduce him. Uh, Stefano received the uh, laurea degree uh, from the University of Pisa in Italy uh, and uh, the PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Genoa in Italy again, 2007, from May 2015 to March uh, 20, uh, 2020. He was assistant professor at Biorobotics Institute of Scuola Sbrae Sant'Anna in Pisa. And uh, he currently is a tenure track assistant professor at the Department of Electrical and Information Engineering of Polytechnic of Bari and a research associate at Scuola Sbrae Sant'Anna uh, in Pisa. He has received uh, many uh, awards at the Student Travel Awards in 2005, and also uh, more uh, recently the Innovation Business Award in 2018. Uh, in addition, uh, he, uh, his research interests include uh, uh, rehabilitation robotics, bioengineering, human-machine interfaces, motor control and motor recovery, human-robot interaction and e-health application. Uh, also, since 2012, he has been serving as co-chair in the IEEE uh, RAS Technical Committee on Rehabilitation and Assistive Robotics. Uh, so it is uh, really a pleasure for me to introduce uh, his talk that is entitled End Effect or Robotic Systems for Rehabilitation. Please, Stefano, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you so much, Loredana, for your kind introduction. Uh, it is a privilege uh, to me to be introduced by you and uh, to deliver this uh, talk together to this uh, seasonal school. So in order to uh, save some time, hopefully, okay, I will skip uh, my, uh, this slide of presentation. This is the outline of my talk. After uh, an introduction, uh, we will uh, see together uh, the main and the factor robotic device for rehabilitation divided into two main categories, the upper limb and the gate. And after this, uh, we will discuss uh, some open issue and we will see the conclusion. Um, as a start, uh, I would like uh, to share with you uh, the recent uh, um, global estimates uh, of the need for rehabilitation uh, provided by the uh, World Health Organization. And uh, there are more than two uh, billion and a half persons who need uh, um, rehabilitation uh, services in the world. Uh, and this uh, um, article uh, published on Lancet uh, in 2019 uh, shows uh, uh, that this number has increased by 63% from uh, uh, 1919 uh, to uh, uh, 2019. So a, a, a great increase, a great rise of needs uh, for rehabilitation uh, services. And this is the world map of uh, each country's special uh, needs in terms of uh, uh, low back pain, fractures, uh, injuries, uh, hearing loss, vision loss. So all the world uh, uh, has, uh, has these specific needs in terms of accurate and precise uh, rehabilitation services. And this is another um, uh, relevant uh, article uh, published recently last year um, uh, in, uh, in uh, Lancet, uh, where uh, the global healthcare system are invited to give priority uh, to rehabilitation. But going into detail, uh, this is a, a, a sketch of the possible uh, trend of uh, decreasing of a functional uh, capacity uh, in, in normal aging. You see uh, the, the, the trend, uh, just okay, to show you these uh, lines which represent the normal aging, but in some cases, unfortunately, there is an acceleration of the aging, you see, uh, due to pathologies, uh, uh, trauma, accidents, uh, and so a person uh, enters the fragility area. Uh, and after the fragility, they enter also, in, uh, in some cases, in disability in ADL, 
ADL are uh, the uh, it's the acronym for activities of daily living. So, in order to uh, try to decrease uh, this uh, this curve, this trend, technologies uh, in addition to uh, traditional rehabilitation approach uh, may try uh, to help a person uh, to uh, stay in the in a safe area uh, for a long time. So in this case, uh, uh, we have uh, a lot uh, of different diseases for in the central nervous system, such as the traumatic brain injury, stroke, the spinal cord just uh, uh, introduced by Professor Farina, just to mention the, the main pathologies in the field of neurorehabilitation. So our ability to move uh, around can be um, impaired by damaging neurons in the brain or interrupting the signal pathway via the spinal cord to the muscle, such in the case, uh, as in the case in spinal cord injury. Uh, if we go uh, into detail for uh, uh, stroke, uh, we see that uh, main, imper main impairments are in terms of balance. You see uh, more than uh, around the uh, 49% but also upper limb, arm movement and movement are the most impaired uh, together also with the walking. So 30% um, of person who had a stroke required assistant, assistance, 20% uh, need the help walking, 16% uh, are institutionalized. That is, uh, they don't live alone at home, but they live in a community setting. So impairments have impacts on activity and participation, independence and quality of life. So the mechanism of recovery are uh, different. Uh, we, we don't have a time to enter in detail into this mechanism, but uh, the most important thing is that uh, recovery is a combination of reversal of injury related factors and neuroplasticity. Um, to be honest, we have a good neuroplasticity and a bad neuroplasticity. So uh, as we will see in the next slide, uh, by means of a robotic uh, approach, a robot assisted approach, we try to help the good neuroplasticity, that is to recover and to help and promote motor and cognitive uh, recovery. So neuroplasticity is the ability of the nervous system to respond to intrinsic or extrinsic stimuli by reorganizing uh, its structure, function, or connection. So uh, at the end, the neuroplasticity is the modification of the nervous system on a cellular and behavioral level. Neuroplasticity, uh, it's uh, triggered by injury or activity training. So, uh, the active induced neuroplasticity is based on active training because active training enhances neuroplasticity and results in reorganization of cortical maps. And there is a, a big amount of studies, neuroscientific studies in the last decades uh, proving this. Uh, main, uh, uh, the main articles, the main uh, uh, papers uh, in this field are based uh, on the analysis of MRI. Uh, so they are very complex in terms uh, of protocol, uh, but uh, we have a strong evidence uh, on the fact that active training uh, can help uh, to uh, promote recovery. Which are the key factors for recovery? Uh, here in this slide, uh, we have uh, the four main pillars. Uh, the first is uh, intensity in terms of repetition, duration, distribution and frequency, effort and difficulty. Then we have a second pillar, uh, which is represented by psychological factors. One of the main, it's, the, it's a motivation. So patient should be, have to be motivated. The third pillar is the manner. What, what is manner? Manner, it means uh, task segmentation, uh, specificity, functionality, variability, the initiation and the shaping of the movement. And the fourth pillar is information. We have to give back feedback and uh, appropriate instruction uh, to the patient. So neuroplasticity and learning can be driven by key factors, such as the four we have just discussed, taken from motor learning theory. 
During the years, uh, we passed from uh, an intuitive medicine, uh, th this uh, was the case uh, of the 16th and 18th century, then we moved to more empirical medicine in the 19th century, now we just entered the precision medicine. So uh, in terms of evidence-based medicine, uh, we are working within this framework of rule-based framework approach. In the field of rehabilitation medicine, there are a lot of uh, uh, approaches in terms of uh, imaging, genetics, therapies, which corresponds to manual therapies, uh, instrumental therapies. There is uh, an important trend uh, of uh, biomarkers uh, to be discovered. And last but not least, uh, wearable and robotics. So we will discuss in the next uh, uh, minutes about the contribution of robotics to uh, rehabilitation, especially as regards and effector system. So the potential impact of technologies in, in the field of rehabilitation is high because starting from the training, we can assist, we can have proof, evidence of movement and sensor input in terms of muscle strength, uh, technologies uh, may provide uh, uh, varied goal-oriented repetition uh, and a feedback uh, for, for, for a successful performance. So all these uh, aspects uh, may promote, uh, as already said, uh, may promote and guide uh, neuroplasticity and motor learning. Uh, what is the effect, what is the outcome of this uh, motor learning uh, and uh, pr promoted neuroplasticity? It's an improved the performance for the patient and a reduced support. Uh, in our field, that is bionics and biorobotics, uh, we usually focus on engineering side, which is something we are well familiar. But in terms of inspiration, uh, we received inspiration for our uh, for the development of biorobotic uh, system from neuroscientific studies. This is uh, very important because uh, uh, the ground, the, 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 the foundation of uh, robotics uh, for rehabilitation is in neuroscientific studies. And I will demonstrate uh, this uh, in the next slide. Uh, the history of robotics uh, is uh, fascinating, uh, starting from uh, modern robotics uh, in 1960. And uh, uh, robotics received a lot of inputs from biology, from neuroscience, uh, from bioengineering. And there is a, a parallel evolution of robotics and bionics. Bionics has had the two waves. The first wave you see here was from 1975 to 1990. And then a second and final wave, we are still living, it's the so-called new bionics. So starting from uh, uh, modern robotics, uh, we moved to industrial robotics, uh, then service and humanoid robotics. And we started with the first biomedical application in the 90s, okay? Uh, together with the bioinspiration. So this is a very, very uh, fascinating history of science and technology and where a lot of person have uh, promoted and worked and contributed to this field. Let's go into detail. So as regards the robotic therapy, how to categorize a robot assisted therapeutic device? We can divide according, uh, we can divide the, the system according to the mechanical structure. So we have uh, um, uh, exoskeletons and, and a factor based system. So during this talk, I will focus on the second uh, type that is uh, the end factor based. So uh, the attachment location can be in the upper limb or on the lower limb. And the control strategies uh, developed during the uh, last 20 years uh, are different. We can have a full guidance, that is uh, the, the, per the person, the patient is uh, passive, is completely guided by the robot. We can have more sophisticated uh, control strategies such as the patient cooperative, and then we have also other types of um, control strategies, such as a free space, that is a, a free exploration of a, a bidimensional or three-dimensional space. 
Uh, as regards to the exoskeleton, I will not stay so long. You know that uh, uh, it's a, a well uh, typical uh, structure um, where uh, uh, we have uh, joints uh, which transmit forces to different robotic segments. Uh, we have, uh, in terms of uh, upper limb, the possibility of uh, uh, guiding uh, the, the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist, in some cases also the end, and a similar situation for the lower limb, starting from the ankle, passing to the knee, and to the ankle. Uh, what about the end effector? The end effector is completely different. Uh, in the end effector device, uh, we have uh, a single attachment. So we have uh, the robotic structure, the mechanical structure attached to a single body segment. You see, it can be in, uh, attached to the wrist or in the hand as regards to the upper limb or to the foot as regards uh, the lower limb. But we don't have a direct control of the single joint. So so it means that in that case, we don't control the, sh the shoulder, we don't control the elbow, and as regards the lower limb, we have no direct control of the hip and of the knee. So uh, we have uh, advantages and disadvantages for the two uh, families. Let's give a look to the end effector. Uh, as regards the end effector uh, system, the structure is simpler if compared to the exoskeleton, also in terms of control. These systems are easy to adjust, uh, to be adjusted to the anthropometric size of the patient. But as regards these advantages, uh, the limb posture is not fully determined. As we already said, uh, there is a limited force uh, position data available, and there is a risk of joint injury. Uh, let's go to see the history, which started, uh, uh, let's say, with uh, a very important system to us for our community, which is the MIT Manus. Uh, I will spend uh, some time uh, for describing this system. But you see, starting from the 90s, uh, there was an evolution of different uh, um, end effector systems, such as the mirror image movement uh, enable at the Stanford University, the arm guide uh, at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, then a system, an haptic system, the gentle uh, at the University of Reading in UK, and so on. Uh, so uh, we have to differentiate between a robotic end effector system focused on proximal segments and those who are more focused in distal segments. The proximal segments are shoulder and elbow. Distal segments are um, wrist and hand. So we assisted, we have seen a lot of devices developed during the last 20 years. We, we have to tell also that uh, only few are available in the market and most uh, uh, remain in the phase of uh, prototypes, which was uh, important because uh, they allow to make a lot of uh, uh, feasibility, uh, proof of concept study. Uh, but let's say the proof of evidence, the recent proof of, of evidence is based only on uh, devices uh, uh, who are available on the market. Uh, just uh, to show you uh, uh, the, the richness of the contribution of bioengineering to the field, uh, here I, we can have uh, an, uh, let's say, uh, first one of the first example of uh, uh, end effector robot for rehabilitation. You see, it was based on an industrial uh, Puma uh, device uh, system. Uh, so it, uh, it, it is based on the two degrees of freedom and it's a for a elbow for arm manipulator. Uh, it was developed at Palo Alto, Stanford University. Uh, so it's a prototype. Uh, it's a prototype. It was important. Uh, you see the date of the pub publication is 2000. So just uh, 21 years ago. Uh, and it was based on a master slave mode uh, where the robot continuously move uh, the paretic limb to the mirror image position of the opposite limb. That is uh, the unaffected limb um, work works uh, as uh, a reference for the paretic limb. Another type uh, of system developed uh, 
at, at, at initial stage of this uh, important uh, research area, it's the so-called ARM guide. Uh, the ARM guide uh, was uh, developed at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And you see, again, this publication is dated back to 2000. And uh, it's uh, based on a different approach because here you have a linear uh, track uh, where uh, the uh, upper limb can move uh, way uh, forward and back. And uh, there was uh, the possibility of analyzing forces. Uh, this is an important point. In addition to kinematics, uh, just from the, the beginning, uh, colleagues uh, discovered the importance of, the importance of uh, monitoring uh, the uh, interaction forces. Um, so it was a, a, a great uh, and a fundamental contribution to the field. Um, this is another type of system called B menu track. Again, we are around 2003. Here, the focus is on the wrist. You see, it's just one degrees of freedom and the factor rubber. And here you can make exercise, you can provide exercise in terms of bilateral uh, elbow, uh, prono, and supination, and wrist flex extension. So uh, we have seen, we have, uh, so we are uh, witnesses, uh, the, let's say, the development, the development of different systems, some focused on the shoulder, some on the wrist. And in this case, we have another type of system, the Gentle, uh, developed at, uh, in the UK uh, by Luriero and colleagues. And this system uses haptics and virtual reality technology. Uh, this is more complex in terms of degrees of freedom. Here we have six degrees of freedom. Um, and uh, another end factor device uh, developed uh, by colleagues uh, in Padua, Italy, is the Denere bot at the beginning uh, uh, of uh, the century. Uh, just to mention something about the hand, because uh, usually we are focused uh, on the shoulder, we are focused uh, on the elbow, but the hand, as you know, it's uh, quite complex. But colleagues uh, at Imperial College, um, I would like to mention uh, um, Professor Etienne Bourdet, together with colleagues uh, uh, Lambert C and, and uh, others uh, at uh, Singapore at, uh, University. They have developed uh, this haptic knob uh, for the rehabilitation of hand function. Uh, you see, uh, it's, uh, it is an interesting uh, application of robotics uh, for uh, uh, training uh, and, uh, the hand. Um, unfortunately, it is remained, uh, to the, my best knowledge, uh, to the stage of prototype. However, uh, it was important uh, to focus uh, on the hand function. So starting uh, uh, from the uh, la uh, last two decades, uh, we have assisted to an exponential uh, increase of uh, trials and subject recruited. Here you find the numbers from a Cochrane review, which is an important review in the field of rehabilitation. Uh, this is a review on, uh, uh, on the upper limb. And you see, starting from 2009, uh, we moved from uh, 11 trial uh, to the most recent uh, uh, figure uh, available. It's uh, uh, 2018 with 45 trial. Uh, in this case, uh, when you see trials, uh, it is uh, referred to randomized uh, control trial. That is uh, the highest uh, um, level of evidence uh, in, uh, in clinical research. Um, okay, the conclusion of this uh, uh, review is important because uh, the authors concluded that the people who received uh, electromechanical and robot-assisted arm training after stroke might improve uh, activity of daily living, arm function, and arm muscle strength. However, the results must be interpreted with caution. And this is something that we have uh, to, um, let's say, consider because uh, currently we don't have a uh, um, firm conclusion of uh, uh, which is the best intensity, which is the best duration, the amount of training. We are still looking for this. So uh, research continues. Uh, 
uh, we collected uh, some evidence, but uh, this factor I, I just mentioned, uh, intensity, duration, the amount of training, type of treatment, uh, also the participant characteristics and the measurements to be used is still an open issue. So we have introduced the MIT manus. The, MM, the MIT manus is shown in this figure. You see, it's a, a parallelogram. Um, so the conception, uh, the concept comes from the industrial robotics again, because uh, the MIT manus was and is uh, the first uh, robotic system for upper limb uh, rehabilitation. It was developed by colleagues at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And you see, it's a typically in an effect because the patient is connected to the mechanical structure by means of this handle. Uh, which are the characteristics, uh, the main characteristics of the, the system. Uh, I took uh, this uh, photo in the hospital uh, where uh, this model arrived in 2005. And it was uh, the first model, the first robotic device in Europe. And uh, I was lucky uh, to start immediately uh, to work on this system and uh, to collaborate uh, with clinical staff in order to uh, provide uh, evidence uh, 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 of the possibility of using uh, this system in knee rehabilitation. So here we have uh, two actuators. Uh, I call this uh, um, shoulder and elbow because it corresponds uh, uh, to the movement uh, of the shoulder uh, and the elbow. So here we have uh, uh, these rotational joints which transmit uh, the motion to uh, the hand. And uh, here we can, uh, um, using the system, we can record uh, some very uh, let's say relevant uh, kinematic uh, variables, such as the position uh, in the two axes, uh, x and y, the velocity, again, x and y. But uh, thanks to this force torque sensor, we are able to measure the force. You remember, we said that interaction forces are fundamental for understanding uh, uh, which are the forces exchanged between the patient and the robot. So this is a typical room uh, in the hospital. Uh, this uh, is a picture I took uh, in the, the uh, Auxilium Vitae Rehabilitation Center in Volterra. It's uh, a, a small town uh, located between Pisa and Florence. You see here a physiotherapist monitoring a patient. He is a very young patient. I remember you know, this is a, he was 15 years old when unfortunately he had a, a motorbike accident. So after a coma, he recovered and he started to um, train the elbow and the shoulder. But here you see a similar companion robot uh, the wrist robot. So uh, it's uh, the same family uh, of the MIT Manus. It was developed later, but it is uh, focused on the rehabilitation of the wrist. So in the same room, uh, the same physiotherapist can monitor two uh, patients uh, uh, in parallel. Let's give a look uh, to a short video uh, I took uh, in the hospital. Uh, the, this is an hemiplegic person, the left hemiplegic person, that is, uh, it corresponds to a damage to the right hemisphere. And he is uh, now interacting with the robots, with the MIT Manus. Uh, he has to track, to follow uh, a blinking cursor from the center to the peripheral target, you see? And the robot, the control, is uh, hidden. We can say it's absent because it intervenes it is active only in those directions where the patient is unable to finish or to start the movement, okay? So we have implemented uh, the so-called assist as needed control algorithm. We will, uh, we, we will repeat and we will see details also this concept in the, in, in the, future, in the next slide. So, I would like to share with you uh, the, this uh, history. Uh, we started in the 80s uh, uh, with the neuroscientific uh, studies. As I told you, um, um, robotics for neurorehabilitation is uh, and was inspired by neuroscientific studies. These studies were focused on arm trajectory in animal models and healthy subjects. 
Then we have a, a, a development, a, a technical development. In the case of MIT Manos, the uh, patent was granted in 1995. Then soon after 1998, there was an important seminal article on robot assisted neurorehabilitation by Krebs and colleagues on Nitrapoli transactional on rehabilitation engineering. Then in 2001, there was an article on nature by uh, Professor Bourdet. And uh, soon after, in 2006, uh, an article on error enhancing therapy uh, by uh, James Patton on experimental brain research. So we may, uh, let's say, say that the first wave of robotics started in 1998 and it finished in 2019. So now we are just entered the second wave where a multicentric randomized control trial in UK named RATULS with over than 700 subjects, uh, to be precise, 770 subjects were recruited. Okay, so these are some relevant milestones. And uh, in the next uh, minutes, uh, I will show you some details uh, for each phase. So these are the neuroscientific uh, foundation uh, articles uh, which prepared uh, the path for the development of a um, robotic system for rehabilitation. You see uh, the, the, the key actors are Professor Hogan, Professor Emilio Bizzi. And uh, as you can see from the dates, uh, you see here that uh, this article was written in 1982 in the, and it was published and presented at the America Control Conference. You see also a different uh, typing uh, uh, procedure. Um, okay, and uh, you see also the, the title uh, of these important uh, um, studies. You see arm trajection, uh, trajectory, sorry, formation in monkeys. Mm -hmm. So uh, these uh, studies, these neuroscientific studies, uh, prepared uh, the, the road, uh, prepared the road for the technical development, which arrived soon uh, later. You see another, another relevant. Uh, uh, article uh, which title is uh, neural mechanical geometric factor subserving arm posture in humans again we have professor Musa Ivaldi, professor Hogan and Emilio Bizzi again and this uh, is uh, a, a, an article published in 1985. I'm not going into details but you can see here uh, the, the usage of, uh, of a prototype uh, which we can consider the father of the MIT Manus, uh, but it was uh, built, it was developed not for rehabilitation, it was built for neuroscientific studies. Okay, so the evolution of this prototype is the MIT Manus. Uh, okay, so the MIT Manus is based, as I told you, on an industrial architecture, the, 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 the well-known SCARA, eh? the Selective Compliance Assembly Robot Arm Architecture. Uh, the, main, uh, the main aspect of this uh, architecture are uh, this uh, system has uh, two rotational joints, theta 1, theta 2, in the, fig in the figure on the, on the left, uh, this rotational, first, uh, second rotational joint, then here we have also a, a prismatic joint. Eh? This is a theta three. Uh, the main characteristic of this structure is that it is stiff to vertical loads, but is compliant to horizontal loads. And here you can see the working space of this structure, okay? So the, the MIT Manus was based on this industrial architecture, and these are the original figure from the US patent granted, granted in 1995. And uh, you see the first works, you see here 1992, one of the first works, MIT Manus, a workstation for manual therapy and training. And here, the seminal article I was mentioning, the robot-aided neurobiotician by Professor Krebs. And here, you can see some details on the impedance controller. So the actuation torques are based on the uh, transpose of the Jacob Jacobian. And here we have uh, uh, two uh, uh, important effects. Here, you, you, you can have 
uh, and damping effect multiplied by the velocity. And here you can have a derivative effect multiplied by the error, okay? And these are uh, typical values for the two matrices. Uh, but it was important uh, because uh, uh, starting from this uh, uh, control, uh, it was possible to assist, uh, as I, I told you, the uh, patient only when it is needed. Let's go, let's make a, a step forward in terms of uh, uh, neuroscientific uh, contribution. Uh, in 2001, uh, there was, uh, it was published uh, an important, uh, relevant uh, article by Professor Bourte. Uh, the title was The Central Nervous System Stabilizes Unstable Dynamics by Learning Optimal Impedance. Um, the study was based on a healthy subject, but uh, it had uh, important consequences in terms of uh, uh, new uh, ideas to be applied in neuro rehabilitation uh, in the field of robotics. Because uh, a few years later, Professor Patton described the use of the adaptive training technique uh, in a hemiparetic patient and concluded that an error amplification approach may provide a new pathway for motor learning. So till uh, that moment, uh, the only uh, relevant uh, type of assistance was uh, uh, the, 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 the well-known uh, reduction of the error. That is uh, the guidance uh, to, let's say, the, to help the patient to complete uh, the movement in case the patient is unable to complete the movement itself. Starting from this uh, uh, important contribution, we started to have a second alternative control technique based on the error amplification. Because this, this article, and we are going to see what is the main contribution of this article. And you see again, they used a system very similar to the MIT manus. There was an exposure to divergent field. These are the trajectory in the null field and these are the trajectory of a healthy subject when exposed to divergent fields, and which were provided uh, without uh, any, let's say, uh, advice. And so uh, the, 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 the subject were unaware when the divergent field uh, would be applied. And the discovery was important because uh, and the discovery was that uh, uh, our central nervous system is able to uh, adapt to uh, these uh, disturbances. And the proof is this, uh, um, you see in the, in, the, in the green, it's the original uh, ellipsoid uh, corresponding to uh, the stiffness of the upper limb where there is no field. But when the divergent field is applied, there is a kind of rotation of the ellipsoid uh, of stiffness. So it corresponds to the uh, adaptation of our central nervous system to the new uh, condition, okay? So based on this, uh, you see uh, that there was this uh, um, article uh, entitled Evaluation of Robotic Training Forces that either enhance or reduce error in chronic and hyperetic stroke survivors. So again, from a neuroscientific science, we have an evolution in terms of a robot-assisted approach. And again, uh, the system used was uh, uh, the, the, the father of the MRT Manus. And here you can find uh, the results uh, where uh, you see the clockwise uh, scenario uh, is shown. Here we have the trajectory in unperturbed baseline. Here we have early training when disturbances are applied. And this is the final training. Uh, these are the demonstration that when uh, we remove the, the disturbances, there is an after effect and a final washout, okay? So this is a kind of uh, uh, second step starting from the work of uh, Professor Bourdet. And again, uh, thanks to this approach, uh, it is possible to measure the error, hmm? uh, both in stroke subject and in healthy subject. 
So th there was uh, an interesting uh, proof uh, of applying uh, disturbances uh, forces in order to magnify errors. And uh, the question was, uh, which are the patient who can benefit more from exposure of disturbances instead of being assisted? This is, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, an open question. But uh, we are, mm, let's say, uh, lucky to work in this field because the contribution uh, which come uh, in this area are so relevant uh, for the uh, increasing the quality of life of patients. Uh, you remember that uh, some slides ago, uh, I, I, I said that uh, um, only recently, that is uh, uh, two years ago, 2019, there was the first uh, uh, relevant um, uh, randomized control trial um, based on robot assisted training for the upper limb after stroke. Here, uh, colleagues have recruited uh, 770 participants. Unfortunately, the conclusion are not so good for us because you see, you can read with me. Robot assisted training did not improve upper limb function after stroke. So these results do not support the use of robot assisted training as provided in this trial in routine clinical practice. So uh, um, the, 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 the protocol was based on an MIT manus. Uh, to be honest, uh, there was no uh, focus uh, on uh, proximal or distal segments. That is, uh, the protocol was uh, extended to all the joints. And maybe the reason for not uh, having good results can be uh, found in this wide spectrum of uh, first type of stroke. That is, they have recruited not only subacute, but also chronic. So the, we have a mix up of different severity patient, stroke patient, and also uh, the fact that the primary outcome was uh, uh, this ARAT. ARAT is a clinical uh, outcome measure uh, for measuring uh, uh, the function of the end. And uh, if you go into detail in, uh, in the study, you see that uh, the end was trained, but no, was not primarily trained uh, because the training was distributed along the upper limb. However, uh, this is a sign uh, of the fact that the community is active. We are still working a lot. And so this is another contribution to the field. But only recently, as I told you, we achieved this important uh, um, fact that is uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, randomized control trial in UK with uh, so many patients. Because uh, in the last 20 years, uh, we had uh, a lot of cohort studies with very few um, patients, uh, very few subjects recruited. So now it's the time to start with very large multicentric uh, studies uh, recruiting a lot of patients in order to understand more and more about the effect of robot assisted therapy in a person with neurological disease. Okay, uh, let's, let's move uh, forward. Ah, okay, this is a, a recent study uh, published just a few days ago uh, where I am one of the author and I am lucky uh, to be part of this national community of physiatrists, physiotherapists uh, working uh, in this case for a national consensus conference promoted by the two uh, medical societies, scientific societies uh, active in the field of rehabilitation. Uh, I would like to, to uh, comment with you these results because here we have counted the, the number of end effector EE and exoskeleton. You see that in all studies that we have analyzed, uh, there is a, a kind of uh, um, balance because we found 47 end effector devices and 53 exoskeletons, okay? So now we can say that if, as regards uh, uh, the, um, the, 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 not only the upper limb, because these studies is on the upper limb and the lower limb, there is a substantial uh, balance uh, among, uh, between the two categories, okay? And you can see then also in terms of, of adults, uh, as regard the upper limb, we have more end effector system and the, the exoskeleton are 18. As regards the uh, gait, the walking and balance, we have uh, 10 end effector robotic system and 29 exoskeletons. This is for adults. As regards the, uh, the childhood, 
In the childhood, we found seven robotic system uh, and effector system, and only one as a skeleton. Uh, and for the, uh, as regards the gait, uh, walking and balance, uh, nine system are mm, and the factor and eight are exoskeleton. So this provides you, uh, uh, let's say, some relevant facts, uh, uh, let's say, uh, now. What was important, uh, uh, particularly important in the first stage uh, of uh, um, robot assisted rehabilitation, uh, and uh, I, I have 10 minutes, so I will, I will uh, go um, quicker in the next slides. It's uh, the acceptability, because uh, till now we have talked about uh, technical aspects, uh, motor control, uh, mechanism, structure, uh, interface, and so on. But do the patient really enjoy the uh, proposed uh, robot-assisted therapy? And uh, we have published uh, uh, many years ago uh, this study on the acceptability, and based on the results, uh, we provide two different scenarios, the original clock-like, clock the one you have seen in the video, and another adapted a new, let's say, uh, different uh, scenario based on a fan, uh, where I have distributed the, the, the target on a, a, a fan in order to uh, promote uh, the extension of the elbow instead of reinforcing also the, the, the flexor synergy of the elbow and, the, and the, the shoulder. So from these results, you can see there is a substantial acceptability of patient uh, of these therapy. Okay, this is important uh, to me uh, to understand what are the perception of the patient. Uh, this was one of the first studied, uh, studies uh, where uh, we recruited uh, subacute and chronic uh, stroke patient uh, and together with healthy subject uh, for reference uh, purposes. Uh, the intervention usually in, uh, in this study are based on three to five sessions per week, four weeks, because this is a typical length of uh, hospitalization. Uh, in each session, uh, we have uh, uh, some movements which are non-assisted, uh, other movements uh, which are assisted uh, based on the adaptive uh, um, uh, approach. So during a, a session, uh, so a patient can uh, move for more than 1,000 movements, okay? So the, the training is based on, on 1,000 movements, okay? And we use the clinical outcome measure, okay? I'm not going into details, but we use the, the well-known Fugelmeier assessment and motricity index. And uh, as a community, uh, we uh, started to propose a different uh, uh, metrics, different kinematic parameters, not only me, but uh, uh, other colleagues, uh, Professor Zollo and other colleagues uh, uh, in, uh, in, in other group in Europe, uh, in the US, in Japan, they started to uh, propose a different metrics, okay? So uh, the first evidence was based on clinical outcome measure, sorry. Uh, so you can see here that uh, uh, there was uh, an important uh, change between uh, the start and the end of the treatment, but also standard deviation were high, okay? Uh, and uh, we got also interesting uh, results in terms of improvements, statistically significant improvement of kinematic parameters. Uh, you see here uh, mean speed, the numbers of peaks, uh, which is a, a measure of smoothness of the movement, uh, and some metrics. Uh, this is a, a, a speed metric and acceleration metric. But the most important fact is that between the start and the end of the, the treatment, there was a, a, a significant improvement. Um, these are uh, mean values, okay, for the for the group. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of uh, start of the movement, okay? And we also analyze the correlation, uh, correlation between clinical scales and kinematic parameters. Uh, to be honest, uh, we have not find, found uh, strong, uh, in, in many cases we have found only moderate correlation, but uh, this is uh, good because it means that we need both approach. We need the clinical scales, and we need the kinematic parameters for, uh, let's say, providing a complete assessment of the upper limb. This is a typical comparison. You see uh, baseline evaluation and post intervention uh, assessment. Okay, so usually in rehabilitation, you compare mm, these two uh, time, okay, T0, T1. And we provide, uh, as I told you, uh, different metrics. This is uh, uh, 
the mean absolute values of the distance of current path from theoretic path, okay? So uh, very simple, but also effective in terms of assessment. Now, starting from clinical uh, outcome measure, uh, we started uh, to provide uh, kinematic uh, assessment not only at the beginning and at the end of the treatment, but also during intermediate steps, steps such as after the 10th session. Here it's after the 20, the 20 session. So uh, it was important to provide such a trend. Uh, you see here that uh, I can, uh, I would like to stress this fact that uh, the, the velocity uh, at the 20 session is higher if compared, you can see the, 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 the small but uh, important difference uh, with the, the end of the treatment. So if we push the frequency uh, to, the be, to the maximum, we can have uh, the, mm, the assessment, the kinematic assessment day by day. This is a graph I have plotted during the first 15 days in, in a subacute. You see, after two days of familiarization, there is uh, an important uh, significant change during the third day. This is not valid for chronic. You see in chronic patient, and here I presented the red dotted line in order to make a comparison with the subacute, you see that there is a substantial plateau. In order to see, let's say, when we see a change, we see a change after 15 days, okay? Because the chronic patient needs more time, more expo exposure time in compared to subacute. In subacute, we can see the first effect in the first 15 days. This was another important step, okay? Till now we have talked about the adults and I have to run, run because otherwise I will be out time. time. Not only adult, we have also a child, but unfortunately, uh, as regards uh, end effector, pediatric version of the robotic device is just a pure adaptation of the original version for adults, okay? Now, uh, there are other studies uh, uh, analyzing EMG, and this is the second uh, generation of robots, mm? the so-called motore developed by a spin-off company of Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, where the dimension are decreased, uh, the weight is less, uh, and there is a possibility of, be, uh, of being used uh, also at home, okay? Um, and recently we have uh, focused also on cognitive aspects, eh, such as memory, attention, and act act action sequence. Uh, what is important uh, is the, also the integration of robotics with other therapeutic approaches, such as botul botulinum toxin. This is an example of integration of two approaches and also uh, brain stimulation. Uh, this is a, a typical example of uh, um, integrating a TDCS. Maybe some of you are uh, familiar with the, the transcranial direct current stimulation and robot assisted treatment. Uh, we performed uh, an RCT and uh, we, do, we did not find uh, any substantial additional effect uh, when we apply TDCS, but uh, you know, TDCS is a, a kind of tricky technique. Uh, I go quick, uh, uh, please uh, uh, apologies for this. Let me uh, go quick uh, to the next uh, aspect because otherwise we don't have time uh, to treat uh, all the aspects. Now, uh, just a, a quick reference to the end. You see, uh, there are also specific uh, ro end effect robotic system for uh, uh, the, the uh, training, uh, the finger uh, extension, uh, uh, the same approach uh, as clinical scales, uh, uh, kinematic parameters. Now, let's go to give a look to the gate and then I will conclude. Uh, this is a typical manually assisted rehabilitation, but in addition to this, in the last 20 years, we have assisted to, to the development of a different robotic system um, for, for, for the gate. Uh, in this case, we have an exoskeleton, the, so -called, the, the famous locomat, but also end effector, such as the one you are seeing in this video, okay? So lower limb therapeutics uh, uh, robots, uh, uh, the history is uh, similar to the uh, upper limb. And this is uh, a, an end effector system uh, developed recently. Uh, the, the starting was a locomat for spinal cord injury. Uh, this is based on, uh, on two orthotics, uh, two orthesis. Uh, so it's more in the field of exoskeleton. This is the gate trainer. This is an end effector system. Again, you see from the dates, we are in the 2000. 
The Apti Walker, a prototype developed at the Fraunhofer Institute, and the Geo system, uh, one of the more recent, this is the end effect, an end effector system. Okay, it's very complex. You can have also a simulation of stairs climbing and uh, descent and ascent. And also, as regards the lower limb, we have a relevant, if small, um, proof that a person exposed to robot assisted uh, gait training. Uh, show improvements, okay, in uh, of gates. This is, a, but there is no differentiation in this study between end effector system and exoskeleton, okay? So let's go to the end. Uh, uh, where we are working, uh, it's uh, on the attempt to make a correspondence between the severity of the damage of the impairment. This fac is a functional ambulation classification. You see zero, no, no trunk control, four, five, good gait. So in order to allocate for each uh, patient the appropriate robot, okay? So this is uh, the attempt we are uh, working uh, in the community to find the most suitable robot for the specific patient. Okay. There are a lot of uh, challenges, uh, and the challenges uh, are also in the field of uh, big data because uh, we, we have electronic health, we have mobile health, we have automated health, and uh, robotics can play a, a role in uh, this field. This is a recent uh, um, review I prepared uh, together with colleagues uh, from uh, University of uh, Columbia. Uh, where there is uh, the interaction between robotics and AI, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, there is no time uh, for commenting, but uh, it is important that uh, artificial intelligence will be part uh, of the robotics for Riyadh, okay? Uh, because uh, the interaction between AI and robotics uh, is important in terms of early detection, diagnosis, uh, decision-making, uh, treatment, uh, research, and training. Okay, all of these uh, uh, technologies uh, we have seen, imaging, uh, stimulation, brain stimulation, functional electrical stimulation, neuroscience, AI, all these approach may be relevant for the functional outcome of the patient, okay? So the open issue we have already discussed, uh, I would like just to focus on function the re recovery, that is our aim is to improve ADL uh, activity and the conclusion is from the pioneering, uh, pioneering uh, stage of rehabilitation of the last two decades, this is the last, uh, the, the MIT manus, you see the therapist uh, helping the patient to move uh, the, 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 the mechanical structure. We are just passed to the second generation of robots for rehabilitation assistance, and uh, it is a, AI driven. So the summary of the first wave of technical development were stiff mechanical structure, actuation mainly electrical, sensor encoders, tachometers, force torque, control technique based on position and impedance admittance. The type of assistance was adaptive, assisted needed, active or resistive, and error augmentation. As regards to the performance, performance are actually based on clinical outcome measure plus kinematic parameters and movement uh, methods. The type of studies, uh, the studies, uh, uh, mainly the, in the last two uh, decades were proof of concept, feasibility and cohort study. Only few RCTs were carried out. The user interface uh, is uh, based uh, on uh, basic function. There is no prediction trends uh, so far, no automatic or semi-automatic difficulty level changes. So these are the challenges for the future. As regards adult child uh, rehab, the version for pediatric age derived from adult ones. We need specific uh, machines for uh, childhood, okay? So I'm going uh, to conclude uh, to invite you to join uh, the technical committee uh, of the ITRAPOLI RAS Rehabilitation Assistive Robotics. Uh, you can find easily uh, on the ITRAPOLI uh, RAS uh, website. These are the acknowledgement to the uh, funding bodies, uh, Scuola Sant'Anna, Regione Toscana, Pisa University Hospital and Tuscany Healthcare System, and uh, the different uh, and uh, rehabilitation center where I work. So I thank you so much uh, for your attention. Uh, this is uh, my uh, email address, uh, and I hope you have joined uh, this lecture. And I am re here ready uh, for answering your uh, comments and uh, questions. Thank you so much uh, for your time. 
Thank you very much, Stefano, for your uh, very exhaustive overview of the end effect of machines for upper and lower limb for rehabilitation purposes. Uh, and uh, there is now room for questions. I was waiting question. Okay. Thank you, Manuel Velet, please. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I feel fortunate to be able to share in this space with all of you. I have a question. Um, from your experience, is there any methodology that defines the use of end effectors devices over exoskeletons or vice versa from a new rehabilitation point of view? I mean, what factors can mm, determine the use of one kind of device or the other. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Manuel, for this relevant question. Um, uh, honestly, uh, there are no uh, clear recommendation, neither nor from technical, neither clinical point of view. Uh, we are still, uh, let's say, uh, fighting against this. Uh, I can tell you something like this. Usually in this uh, first uh, two decades, uh, uh, the choice uh, was based on the availability. If you go in some hospital, you can find some end effect device. In some other hospital rehabilitation center, you can find exoskeleton. So the choice uh, is based on, the, uh, let's say, the fact that uh, you find uh, already available this uh, uh, type of device uh, in the place where you work. So it is not based on uh, scientific evidence, but I can tell you something because uh, recently uh, we are uh, answering uh, this question. And also in the next lecture, uh, uh, then in the lecture of uh, uh, Dr. Molinari, you can uh, hopefully you can find uh, some uh, answer to this uh, question uh, from the clinical point of view. I can tell you something, uh, uh, what we have uh, learned from, uh, from uh, this, uh, the first uh, 20 years. It seems that uh, the exoskeletons uh, can be useful uh, for subjects uh, which are who are uh, very severe. Okay, the person who need, uh, uh, let's say, the first, the first, the first uh, phase of recovery, where uh, the joints uh, are no are not well controlled by the patient due to the neurological impairment. After the first exposure to the exoskeleton uh, robotic device, uh, the second stage could be an end effector based uh, approach. Okay. But this is my personal, uh, let's say, uh, attitude, my personal, what I learned from uh, uh, my work in the field. Uh, unfortunately, I have no firm uh, conclusion and evidence of this. But uh, talking with the uh, physiatrist, uh, physiotherapist, it seems that the uh, exoskeleton can be useful uh, in the first uh, stage of recovery, okay? And, and the factor later on. But uh, we are still uh, analyzing, investigating this field. Uh, so in the future, maybe we can have uh, other uh, good uh, answer. Thanks to RCTs, uh, maybe focus it on this comparison on the two types of robotic device. It's very clear for me. Many thanks. Thank you so much. Stefano, I can see a question for you in the chat. Miranda, maybe if uh, you can uh, uh, make your answer directly. Uh, your question for um, you. Okay, of course. Sorry. Hi, uh, hi, Stefano. Thank you so much hi, for your hi. talk. I found it really interesting. Um, I had two questions about uh, the possible ongoing research at the moment. So I was wondering if there was any research into making the end effective machines portable as it could be really useful for assisting with ADL and also into um, the possible psychological impacts. Um, I've been recently taking a look into the psychological impact of uh, prosthetic limbs that don't necessarily look like human hands and one particular piece of research I came across recently was about how the brain adapts to an additional thumb and I was wondering if these end effect machines are possibly having an impact on the um, user in the long run if they don't necessarily look like a human hand if that makes sense. 
Thank you, Miranda. Uh, these are two very relevant uh, questions. As regards to the first, uh, um, to be honest, uh, uh, the research uh, uh, till now has not uh, brought uh, uh, to portable um, and effector machine. We have just a few prototypes, uh, and I know just, uh, um, I think, one device for the lower limb. Uh, but uh, to be honest, uh, till now, and the factor are not portable, and this is uh, a drawback. Uh, we have to work uh, in the next uh, in the next years, no? and uh, because uh, as you said, it's important because uh, portability uh, it means uh, uh, the fact that you can uh, use uh, this uh, system not only in the hospital but also outside the hospital, at home, uh, in the community, uh, in the streets, and so on. So, uh, yeah, um, but now, currently, we do not have such a portable um, end effector uh, device for rehab or assistance, uh, to the, my best knowledge. Uh, as regards to the second point, uh, this is uh, quite important. I have to tell you that uh, we just recently discovered the importance of analyzing uh, the psychological impact. Uh, how to explain this? Maybe in the first years, uh, we were focused uh, only on technical aspects, okay? Technical developments was the focus, let's say mechanical structure, sensor, uh, what I already said. So uh, the sensitivity uh, to ask uh, and to investigate uh, the psychological impact was not uh, so diffuse. But I can tell you something. Recently, I see the community more prone, more, uh, let's say, it is, it is ready. We are ready uh, to uh, analyze, investigate the psychological uh, aspect, uh, the impact of using uh, uh, this end effector machine on the patient. Uh, because it's, a, it's a relevant, it's important, because we have, I think, I have, we have also to adapt our design choices based on this uh, psychological aspect. And uh, till now, we have not fully included uh, this aspect in our design uh, approach, design procedure. So I look forward uh, to seeing from you, uh, let's say as young uh, researcher, that you will include uh, starting from now, this aspect uh, in the next generation of robots. So, uh, we have great expectation from you guys. So thank you, Miranda, for this important uh, question. I hope I have answered uh, to your question. Uh, yes, you have. Thank you. And thank you again for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Okay, thank you very much, Stefano. I can see another question for, for you. Mattia, Mattia Franchi di Cavalieri, please. Hi, sorry for intruding again. Um, I was uh, wondering for the children aspect, uh, in, uh, in, uh, for the psychology uh, aspect of the children usage of, uh, uh, of robots for rehabilitation, because in my, my mind, I think that the, the children are uh, uh, less prone to use such device for, const uh, for constriction. Are there some uh, reviews or some papers that states, uh, in particular for children, because you state about the uh, the acceptance of the of the instrument? Because uh, I was thinking that maybe if uh, so, if this uh, is not uh, um, we cannot overcome these issues, we can uh, uh, delegate the uh, the rehabilitation aspect to the clinic and par and maybe the assessment to other instruments like the wearable sensors, for example. What is your opinion on that? Uh, if you have some reviews that can be used uh, for reference. Thank you, Mattia. Uh, to be honest, I don't think there are uh, reviews on this. There are a lot of studies in a, a child, um, uh, let's say in the use of robot assisted uh, rehabilitation, especially for gait in child. Mm -hmm which demonstrate that uh, kids, uh, children, they enjoy, they have a good perception of this therapy because it's based on games. It's like a game, okay? okay. So they are not perceiving uh, this is uh, uh, what they are uh, carrying out. Uh, it's uh, a rehabilitation treatment, okay? 
please remember that there is always the presence of the therapist. I have not uh, stressed so much, but not in case in, no, because it's important not to think about a bilateral, let's say, a unique bilateral direction between the patient and the robot. We have always a, a, a therapist, an operator. So it's a, a triangle, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it is important because if you think that maybe we as a healthy subject, we can have a, a dietary relation with the robot, but for patient, there is always the presence of the physiotherapist. Saying that, I think the presence of the, presence of the physiotherapist can motivate the child uh, to, to, to continue the rehab, always what is, uh, this is my knowledge, in terms of gain. That's why the psychological aspect of the child uh, are uh, safe, okay? Uh, so I think they, they are prone and they enjoy, they enjoy the, 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 the treatment. Uh, can you please sum up uh, the second part of the, or, or your second question, please? Yeah, no, it was consequent to the psychological part because if, if children does not enjoy. I was focusing particularly on the upper limb, but even if even in that case, we can uh, use games uh, like them, you know, if you know, can, Kimeya, uh, WRS uh, devices, so the principle is the yeah, same. Exactly. I was uh, more focusing on the constraint of the of the wrist, of the upper limb. Uh, I don't know, yeah. uh, in my opinion, could be a problem. But uh, the fact is that uh, uh, if the uh, psychological part does not uh, subsist, uh, it, it does not uh, make it, it can be used. Uh, I think, I think uh, in, uh, in, uh, for child, uh, the, the, this problem is not very, very strong. Mm. Okay. This is very strong in adult, uh, where you can find a uh, depressed person or person with anxiety, let's say mm -hmm. with uh, by, by behavioral or psychi uh, psychiatric disorders. Okay. To me, the, my experience is that uh, I found some person with depression and with the, this person, it's uh, very difficult to engage and to motivate them to carry out uh, the training, okay? So what you said uh, to me, it's more relevant in uh, adults uh, than uh, in child. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mattia. Okay, thank you very much. Mattia and Stefano for, for your availability to address all the, the questions. But we have no more time for that. <laughs> yes, yes. Very we late. are a little bit out of time. Yes, I will, um, and 